I'm going to start off with a cliché. I'm an academic, and we're full of them, I guess. I don't I'm going to say that we are always evolving. Yeah? The important thing for me as a semiotician is to determine how we're evolving. Where do I find evidence for the evolution, and how, what does it mean to us today? Why? Because the things that we produce with our brain, words, symbols, and signs, tell us what's in the brain. Are we changing? <laughs> oh, are we ever? Is there any evidence for this? You know, the semiotician will look for small-scale experiences of the larger-scale thing. Is there any one sign today that indicates how we are changing? Yeah, take a look at it. That's the face with tears of joy. That was chosen in 2015 by the Oxford English Dictionary as the word of the year. Word? <laughs> it's hardly a word. It's a picture. I guess it is a kind of word. The word emoji means picture word. Not only, but the Oxford Dictionary on its website said, we chose it because that's where things are going. Wow. So the Oxford Dictionary is a semiotics <laughs> dictionary. It looks for change in words, in signs, and in symbols. Now, if it stops there, you'll say, well, so what? Well, we really have to start at the beginning. How did we come about to do something like this? Where It doesn't grow on trees. It must have come from some historical source. So let's go to the beginning. Hmm. This occurred 17,300 years ago. It's amazing. In fact, anthropologists call the first types of paintings, this is in Lascaux, France, paintings or uh, inscriptions or sculptures of any kind is the great leap forward from living basically on instincts to thinking. We became a smart species. That shows it. Look at how marvelous that is. How do you understand? What do you get from this? You can't read it. You look at it, and you extract feeling from it. Marvelous. Just look at that. It's absolutely amazing how much feeling you can get from it. And it was done 17,300 years ago. Now, let's jump forward to the present century. <laughs> you may say, oh, sure, of course. It really is still... Same kind of instinct. Abstract art, expressionist, mm -mm, it's a child. All you have to do is put paper in front of a child, not a cave wall. Maybe if you do have a cave wall, they may write on it. Paper, give them a pencil or a crayon, and instinctively, instinctively, they start to do something like that. Nobody has taught it. In fact, they're so proud of it because it's a magic in the brain. It's images that are there that need to come out. They come out through the hands, and they express what they see. It's almost like a dream world coming to life. Nobody has ever taught them this. Okay, so, so far, so good. Images are the way we create sense and meaning and represent the world. Now look at this. The images are still there. This is, of course, hieroglyphic writing. But look at the difference here. There's an enormous difference here. There are still images, but now you don't get a whole sense out of it like you got from that cave drawing or the child's drawing. You have to read these in a sequence, starting from a spot, presumably the left, and go around it. So you're not anymore feeling or sensing, you're thinking. You're reading. And in order to make any meaning from it, you have to go through it all, and then at the end, step back and say, what did it mean? What a change in the brain, honestly. This occurred, well, 5,000 years ago. For the first time ever in the history of humanity, we wrote our thoughts so that we could literally see our thoughts before us. Writing is an incredible accomplishment. You won't have history without writing. There's no such thing as history without writing. You can recount events orally, but history actually records them in order, in a sequence. Now, what happened after that? Well, here we are. All of a sudden, in the ancient marketplaces of 
of you know, the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. Instead of using pictures, which are, you know, it's complicated to write them, um, to, to inscribe them, let's use symbols for sounds. Yeah, just like digits, instead of using a lot of, like the Roman numeral system, use a couple of symbols to represent all possible numbers. Same thing here. What, 24, 25, 26 of them will do to make absolutely any word you need. However, there's still vision in that. We're not, our eyes are not trained to see what they were originally. Let me take the letter A. The letter A starts as a pictograph. In Egypt, it's the Aleph, the ox. When it gets to Sinai, you can see that they remove some of the details of the ox. When the Phoenicians came about, they say, okay, all we need to do is represent it in this form and just pronounce the first letter for the ox. And then when you get to the Greeks, you get to that, right? And now the ox is back on its horns. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? That A has a long pictorial history behind it. Now, when you have that A and other letters now, you can kind of ignore the picture writing. You can start writing thoughts. And, you, and when you write the words, you can actually hear the sounds of the words. That's a different way. That's a different brain. Now, here's what must have happened. We now have writing, and the brain kind of splits into two parts. There's the part that is used now to reading and thinking, and the other part is still involved in pictures and feeling and in sense. And what happens is this split brain creates an enormous experiment in humanity. In fact, that left side of the brain, which has writing and needs to be trained to do it, develops things like philosophy, science, mathematics, prose. And the other side, which is still there, but separated from that one, draws, creates art, music. In fact, this is the greatest experiment ever in the history of humanity. In fact, the separation of thinking from feeling is the reason why we have great artworks, because the artists now are separated to go ahead and indulge in it, and the other one are the thinkers. Now, are they ever reunited? Oh, yeah. But we still, to this day, think that, well, the arts are over here, right? <laughs> and science and math are over here. Let me give this a little more value. I don't know about you, but when I was in school, music, well, you can do that after school. Uh, in school, you got to do, right, the important things, huh? There is value to a cert so certain signs that we produce because they involve thinking rather than feeling. But what an experiment. Now, by the Renaissance, the beginning of the modern world, the two come together again. Isn't that marvelous? Uh, that's perspective drawing. Look at it. Three dimensions in two. Our eye is completely duped. How did it happen? Well, you have to be an artist, but you also have to be a geometer. In other words, the brain is always trying to reconnect. When it doesn't connect, you know, the world, a disconnected brain, and we've had it for a long time, has also disadvantages. It produces mental diseases. I mean, dyslexia does not occur in a society where there's no alphabets. <laughs> Or there's images. What an experiment, really. And, in fact, one of the great scholars at this university, and Marshall McLuhan, called it the age of print. Um, it's an age where images and feeling have to be separated, indulged in, but the real heavy burden of thinking is in print, and in writing, in phonetic, alphabets. Well, guess what? The brain doesn't want us to be separated for very long. So enter the 20th century. What happened in the 20th century? What started the process to reintegrating the brain? What well, started with the artists. Among them, for example, the futurists. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> uh, where's the meaning? 
<laughs> Where's the writing? Where's the images? Well, you figure it out, right? <laughs> In a sense, you're getting understanding and feeling almost at once. Now, these are artists. This is called futurism, huh? the future. This is how we're going to be reading and communicating soon. And this occurred at the beginning of the 20th century. Interesting, because at about the same time, society itself and institutions within society started to get the idea. Among these are advertisers. <laughs> Why is advertising so persuasive? It's because it created the ad. The ad has the image and the text. That's why we buy things. <laughs> They persuade us. Our brain is integrated, senses it as a whole, and says, yeah, I kind of need those shoes or whatever. It is advertising, even if, they, if, even if I don't need them. <laughs> because it's telling us a message with an integrated brain. Now, Who else knew this? Popular culture, comic books, a new integrated language where this is a, an early 1940s manga. I don't know about you, but I used to love Superman comics as a kid. Why? Because I could see and then read the thoughts. Seeing and reading, that's a language. That's a new way of processing information, of understanding the world, of feeling it, playing with it. In fact, comic book language at first was considered to be kids' language. Although the funnies, when it first started in the form of cartoons, they were called funnies, uh, they were in newspapers. I guess uh, newspapers wanted to sprinkle a little humor, a little game playing into their so-called serious other pages. So this came about. Our eyes and our brains got used to this kind of language. In some cases, we even transferred it to a news, to the screen our new cave wall. Um, you remember the Batman <laughs> um, uh, series on television? <laughs> I thought it was the stupidest thing around. <laughs> they looked like men in tights, and there was boom, bam, wow, and you'd get it on top there. That's a perfect example of a language that is both visual and textual. Hmm? Right there. Okay, so where are we going from here? What happened? Well, you know, it's a small step forward to the emoji. <laughs> Could not have introduced the emoji before that. Emoji started becoming really popular throughout the world as a form of universal communication, figuring that images, you know, pictures um, are worth a thousand words, are more universal so that people with different orthographies and different systems of writing could communicate, could find a common ground of communication. Well, that common ground was already laid in the ancient world, <laughs> when nobody has to tell you how to interpret, how to feel that marvelous cave wall uh, painting. Uh, really, you don't. That's in us. You have to learn the other part, the print. Uh, thinking is, a, is, is an achievement in every generation. Feeling in art is not. It's the default. Now, it's interesting, because what happened Not too long ago, five, six years ago, they decided, well, you know what? This would be good to integrate, to bring it together, and we have a new alphabet. Yeah, that's the new alphabet. And it's an alphabet. It's not random. And it's not you know, casual alphabet. You have to know how to use these. You have to know where to put them in your message. And let me tell you, I'm 70 years old. Okay. I don't use those things, but I do communicate with some of my students, especially the members of my band. We play for charity. Look us up. That's a plug. <laughs> mm. <laughs> If I get a message from one of my semitones, and it doesn't end or have any of these, you know what my next reaction is? I'll write right back. Are you okay? <laughs> Something wrong? <laughs> I got used to it. I understand that we need feeling that when I'm communicating informally, and maybe not so informally anymore, uh, that I need to sense as well as think. 
I also get essays from my students now, and, and the, um, you know, the title page, they will put the, their name, the title, and then they'll put a smiley. <laughs> Do they want a good mark? Probably. <laughs> Imagine me back in the mid-1960s, handing in a paper with a cartoon on it. <laughs> I may have gotten expelled. <laughs> what a changed world. See what I'm getting at? It is changed. These, these are really signs of change. You know, I like them. I, I really, really do. Um, in fact, the, They're everywhere now. They, we're not going to step back in time. This, questo qui non finisce mai. I don't know how to stop it here. Sorry, I'm speaking Italian when I can't speak in English. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have a new cave wall. It's called the screen. You know, you've seen the movie The Matrix, right? Matrix is the screen. We now live on that a lot. And that has its new language, and it's very visual and textual. Just think of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, have I missed any? Um, YouTube, and memes. Memes are new ways of disseminating information, disseminating what I would call graffiti in cyberspace. We love those things because they kind of enlighten the day. We're back in a kind of a tribal village where we wrote on walls and we left messages behind, uh, love messages. You know, I, I examined texts of my students. I'm not kidding you. They gave me their texts gladly, even if it was a romantic text. Can you, I, I could never imagine handing in as research to my professor one of my love letters to my wife and not caring about it. Boy, has the world ever changed. You see what I'm getting at? A simple emoji tells us so much about who we are today, how our brain is processing information, how it's taking it in. And so, I'm going to end. I'm going to conclude. <laughs> in the past, if I was giving a lecture like this, you know how an academic would conclude a quotation from Friedrich Nietzsche or from Hegel that nobody has ever read but quotes anyhow? Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to end in a contemporary. I'm going to say goodbye like this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>